This video looks at the singularities of the Schwarzschild space-time, finding that one is a coordinate singularity while the other is a real physical singularity. It then looks at gravitational time dilation and Birkhoff's theorem. So let's start with a spherically symmetric distribution of matter of mass capital M, and that is not rotating. Now the Schwarzschild line element is given by this object here. Let's go over and look at the Schwarzschild metric, this object here, with these terms in. Now this metric describes the space-time outside the mass M. Now there is a singularity in this metric that is due to the choice of coordinates and is not a gravitational singularity, that is where the curvature becomes infinite. So gravitational singularity, the curvature will genuinely become, genuinely become infinite. So if we look at this metric here, we can see there's a value somewhere of R that leaves this undefined. So let's have a look at that. Now, this singularity occurs as the 0, 0, the time component, goes to 0, and the radial G11 component goes to infinity. So if we look at that, we take the time component, set it to 0, we can solve it for this particular value of the radius. And this particular value of the radius will leave, cause this uh, component of the metric to blow up, to go to off infinity and become undefined. Now this is called the Schwarzschild radius, this particular radius, and we'll give it the subscript S here, is the Schwarzschild radius, and that's 2gm over c squared. Now for many bodies, the Schwarzschild radius is well within the interior of its mass. We'll have a look at the sun as an example of that. So our sun has a mass of 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, and the Schwarzschild radius for this object, if we substitute in the values, the gravitational constant, and the mass of the sun, and the speed of light, will take us 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and very close to the actual value. Square that, and we get a value of approximately 2.948 kilometers. Now, there is a real gravitational singularity at r equals 0, and we will locate that um, shortly. Now, we can use the Kretschmann scalar k to locate real physical singularities as opposed to those that result from a given choice of coordinates, as we've just seen. Now, this scalar is coordinate invariant, and the Kretschmann scalar is given by this contraction of the Riemann tensor, which is rank 4, and this object here, and we'll go over the page, Look at that. So for the Schwarzschild geometry, when we perform this operation, it's very long and very large, which I've not gone into here, but that gives you this object here, 48 g squared m squared over c to the power of 4 r to the power of 6. Now, <clears throat> this blows up at r equals 0. This becomes undefined at r equals 0. This the scalar becomes infinite, the curvature becomes infinite. And so r equals 0 is a genuine physical singularity. But at the Schwarzschild radius rs that we saw on the previous page, this remains finite. If we substitute in 2gm over c squared into here, this whole object still remains finite. The curvature is still finite, and so there is not a singularity at the Schwarzschild radius. That is merely the result of the choice of coordinates, and so with a different choice of coordinates, <coughs> that singularity could be removed. But there is a real physical singularity at r equals zero for the Schwarzschild metric. Schwarzschild space-time has a real physical singularity at r equals zero. Now, Birkhoff's theorem: every spherically symmetric vacuum solution has the Ricci scalar, a Ricci tensor, sorry, set equal to zero, is independent of time. So every spherically symmetric vacuum solution is independent of time, and this means but the space-time outside a spherical, non-rotating, gravitating body must be described by the Schwarzschild metric. So that's any space-time outside a spherical, non-rotating, a gravitating body must be described by the Schwarzschild metric. It also means that a spherically pulsating star cannot give up gravitational waves, which require a time-dependent metric outside the mass. <coughs> Now the gravitational redshift a photon undergoes as it travels between an emitter and a receiver, both at fixed spatial coordinates in a Schwarzschild space-time, and this was the subject to a previous video, 
fact, the very the video just before this one, and we found that the frequency of the receiver, an observer at the receiver there, detects this frequency, at the emitter, a separate observer um, <clears throat> at rest with respect to the emitter, re dete detects this particular frequency. And so in the Schwarzschild space-time, at the, at the emitter and the receiver, here are the relative frequencies, the emitter and the receiver, these objects here. What we want to now do is let the receiver move far away, off towards infinity. So we want to increase the distance of the receiver to, uh, a long way off from the source mass. And if we do that, if we allow the receiver, the distance of the receiver to recede to infinity, to approach infinity, this expression here now will reduce to, as the receiver is moved far from our mass, our relation becomes this object here. <coughs> So the frequency observed, recorded, observed by an observer far away from the mass, its ratio to the frequency recorded at the emitter, so some observer way out here somewhere will detect a certain frequency that is different to the emitted frequency here, and the relation between the two is given by this object here in the limit as this receiver goes off to infinity or far off. All right, but frequencies, of course, are related to period, and so an interval of time measured at the emitter versus uh, a proper time by an observer at the emitter, as opposed to an observer far off, then the ratio of those two from this gravitational redshift relation derived a moment ago, this ratio becomes equal to this object here. And so to give the relation describing gravitational time dilation, we see that the observer far off records on their clock, observes on their clock this interval of time, whereas at the emitter, an observer at the emitter measures this interval of time, and the relation between these two is given by this factor of 1 on the square root of 1 minus 2 gm over c squared r at the emitter. So it's a summary of some aspects of the Schwarzschild space-time, all bear quite briefly. I'll just point out the, the what appeared to be the singularity of the Schwarzschild radius was found that it's nothing more than a coordinate singularity, and a change of coordinates will make that disappear. But at r equals zero, there exists a real physical singularity where the curvature genuinely does become infinite. Okay, that's the end of that.